Would you like for me to pass the microphone around on that one? Yes. Okay. What do you know you should be doing or could be doing that's good for you, but you still don't do it? We're not going to give a testimony on that right now, but that's where we're headed. Not the testimony, but how to take care of that. Rock Springs, I love the fact that we are growing, and we're not only growing in numbers. It seems like we're making contact and, and uh, uh, engagements with about 250 people a week, which praise God for that. But it's not about the size of the church. It is about our effectiveness. Uh, I've heard preachers say, you know, it's not about the seating capacity. It's about our sending capacity. Because believe it or not, there's a whole lot more people outside these walls today than inside. There's a lot more people beyond even our online campus that still need to know there is hope and that Jesus says you belong here. So Rock Springs, we are growing and maturing. But as you remember, uh, whenever you were in your teenage years, because you know that's when you grow tall, um, <laughs> such an oddly placed laughter, <laughs> although I'm laughing with you. I grew six inches in my 14th to 15th year, and that's all she wrote. So I'm just telling you, it's amazing. But while you're maturing, you know, sometimes you get those leg aches. Maturing and the transitions to growing up and showing up is tough. That's a good place to say amen. It hurts. Sometimes going from your freshman year to your sophomore year or going from I wasn't working, I was doing the school thing, now I have to jump into the real world. If you keep on doing what's right, that doesn't make it easy. So we want to keep doing the right things. That's why I say let's stay committed to Christ. Let's commit to each other like we're committed to Christ. Lord, I just, uh, you know, I, I try to tell us all that uh, just because we love Jesus and we say we love one another doesn't mean that we're going to see eye to eye on every single thing. I'm just asking you, if you believe in what God's doing in and through Rock Springs, would you stay committed to me and you, you know, I to you and all of us stay committed to one another and let's work it out. Don't go running. Stay with us. Come on, let's do this together. Let's work hard at unity. Let's work hard at doing excellent things for God. As the old preachers used to say, let's attempt great things for God and let's expect great things from God. Let's do that at the same time. We've got to stay focused. You say, well, what are we focused on? I try to tell you that all the time. We're focused on worship, evangelism, discipleship, ministry, and fellowship. That's the five purposes God lays out for us in Scripture. Those are things we talk about in one way or another every single time we get together. But here's another value, um, and that is we're a church that is intentionally trying to position ourselves for unchurched people. I want us to be the kind of people who go, you know what, I'm not really into the church thing, but those people, as weird as they are, talking about you and me, I kind of like hanging out with them. Not sure I believe everything that they believe, but I feel like I'm wanted. I feel like I'm seen. I feel like there's hope when I'm around those folks. That's what I mean. I want to be a church for the unchurched. Well, if you do that, if you stand between the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom and you're trying to hold on to this and trying to drag as many people in as you possibly can, that's strenuous. It's way easier just to show up for church. I've been through that before. It's easier. But I'm telling you this, if you love risk, if you love the fact that when the stakes get high, the payoff is greater, then you ought to be a part of Rock Springs. Because during this year, we're taking more chances, we're trying to step out in faith in more ways than we ever have before. That means that the assignments are going to be more strenuous. It's one of the reasons I want to talk to you 20-somethings. You know things I don't know. I know stuff you don't know. Let's get together and let's see if we can't make an impact on your generation. <laughs> Which just, you know, this is not in the notes, it's just commentary. Whenever I said, let's do this, and then I got to thinking, how old are these people, and in what generation are they? I'm old enough to have grandkids that are in their 20s. That just, let's just rise for the benediction. I just can't go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I believe that God can work in my generation, and the one right after me, and even in the 20-somethings, and even below that. And I believe we've got to keep passing on the faith, a strong faith. So that's why we've been talking about what is the secret ingredient to all that. And uh, the, 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 to, to give you the preview, because we'll do a review, but let's give you a preview of what we want to deal with today. How many of you just love the word discipline? Wow. Online campus, not a single hand, not a single hand raised. 
The word discipline comes into English from, you know, many different areas. It just means learner and a person who is in the process of learning. <laughs> but it doesn't feel that way, does it? Because <laughs> discipline, yeah, for one thing, it's like, well, if you're a kid and you're parents who don't seem to be clued in to anything, they're just such disciplinarians. I don't like it. Let me give you a little secret, teenagers. Adults don't like discipline any more than you do. It's a term, though, if you stop and think about it, it's a term that we initially hate. But if you lean into it, and you keep leaning into it long enough, you actually learn to love it. And you go, well, that don't make no sense. How many of you work out? You're like, I love that. It's like, how many of you work out? It's like, like, I think you need to work out more because you should be going like, okay. Um, if you've ever been under the, the guidance of a trainer, they're the people that you hate when you walk in, but you love them when you're walking out. Well, I mean, it takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while. But I'm saying, they're the friends that you hate to see coming because you know what you're in for. But if you do what they ask you to do because they love you, then you're glad that they visited with you because your life is better because of what you did. You know, I love all that. I love some of the memes that are out there. One of my favorites is that little chihuahua that's leaned back, that funny look on his face. He's like, fitness? I'm into fitness. I'm into fitness pizza in my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Who really wants to have discipline? Who wants to go down that road? Well, nobody at first. I will just tell you a couple of stories because I think you gotta, I want you to relate to this. When I was growing up, I had a, a very unusual structure to my life. My mom will testify to that. She was my teacher whenever we began traveling full time. She had never been a teacher. I had never been her student. And we also have very similar personalities. So even though I skipped the sixth grade and went into the seventh grade with my material, it took us two years to get through it. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't gain anything. Okay, but I will tell you this: I did have a, 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 a on a, my schooling was coming from Baltimore, Maryland, Calvert School. If you want to know all those details, first time I had ever been asked to write an essay by that time. Okay. I wrote my first essay, sent it in. They send it back all graded, and my teacher <laughs> was like. My Lord, this woman must have bled. She must have cut herself and bled on this, this essay. Come to find out, she wrote a little note. She's like, David, by the look of your other work that I'm examining, you can do way better than this. But you're going to have to do this, 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 and this. That's a form of discipline. And to this day, I'm so thankful to her because now I know how to write. I know how to communicate in an effective way. Our son, Charles David, C.D., he wanted to join the band, the MCHS band, and, you know, jumped in as a freshman. He said, all right, we're going to go and have, like, uh, you know, starts at sometime, like, in August, and we're going to do marching band, and they want us to be there at, like, 6.30. It's going to be great. I'm going to play drums. You see where this is going. He's a freshman, all excited, gets there and realized for, like, two to three hours, you march back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You learn all this stuff. On about, like, the third day, He's like, I don't want to be in band anymore. <laughs> and when Lee and I both went, sorry, you committed, you stay true to it. I will tell you this, the outcome of that is, it was a friend he really hated to see coming, but it was a friend he was glad stopped by. By the time they had gotten through their marching season, they hit number one or something. I, I, it was an amazing uh, accomplishment for that group. And you know what? When it came time for the next August to roll around, he said, are you going to be in band? He's like, Darn right I am. You see where I'm going. This is how we all grow. My friend Robert Fish down here has been dealt a hand that most of us would never ever want to do, but he used a word when I said, how are you doing? He said, I am determined. And each and every day, he does the discipline thing, and he gets stronger. Okay, it applies in practically every area of our life. That's why you'll really never see anyone who regrets good discipline. Because good discipline leads you to good habits. And most of us don't, don't go, oh, I just loathe all my good habits. You know, like saving 
uh, money so that you have money when you don't have money. Uh, you know, no one really regrets a good habit of, I'm going to eat better and therefore I'm going to uh, be healthier. And as much as I believe, you know, your attitude determines your altitude and I think you ought to have good motives, the funny thing is, is that if you actually have good, right, and true habits... If you do those good, right, and true habits, it really doesn't matter what your motive or your attitude is because the outcome is not determined by your motives. It is not determined by your attitude. I wrote it down because I've heard it this way. Direction, not intention, determines your destination. You can say, I intend to, I intend to, I intend to. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm saying if you eat right, for all the wrong reasons, there's still benefit. I'm just trying to get us to understand that the things that build a rock-solid, enduring, durable faith have to do with these same things. Is There are things I'm about to tell you that are ought-tos. You ought to do these. They have proven themselves to be true. But here, I, I think it's on the screen. An ought-to will eventually become a want-to if you practice it long enough. That's what I was trying to get over with, with what we were talking about, uh, Tanya and I were talking about earlier, and that is the endure eventually becomes enjoy. But it takes both. And I want us to live that way because if the, if the challenges coming at us are greater, then we've got to be more durable, and I want you to have a durable faith. <clears throat> if you can take your discipline, choose the good, right, and true habit, It'll become a lifestyle, and it will change your life. I guarantee it. Because the things that are life-preserving, both in our physical life, is also true in our spiritual life. These things are measurably and certifiably good. And that's why I say to you, if you truly want your faith to be strong in a world that literally is running on empty and seems to be you know, stumbling around in the dark and everybody's mad and everybody seems like it's hopeless, can't we be different? Yes, but we have to be disciplined. And I know some of you are going, besides I don't like it. Well, let me come at it one more way. Discipline is what facilitates progress. You're not going to have any forward motion of any good in your life without some form of discipline. It's true for you personally. It's true for you relationally, uh, academically. It's true whenever we, 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 we embrace this as a group. It's, it, it's true. Listen, I don't want to get into politics, but I'm saying if we had good, right, and true habits that we were all practicing in our families and then our community, it still applies regionally. And guess what? It actually would apply nationally. Wow, there's a novel idea. Discipline also facilitates prosperity. That's true for you and your personal finances. It's true for any of our organizations or our government. It's true relationally. Your relationships get better if you are disciplined in your relationships and how you treat them. But here's the part that makes it so difficult. And that is discipline requires delayed gratification. But see, we've become a group of people, and I mean this just as generally as Americans because we've been so extraordinarily blessed. And if you're not careful and being thankful for that, you go, well, I want what I want, and I want what I want right now. And I'm about to throw a hissy fit if I don't get it. I do realize that eggs are very expensive right now. And that's a bummer. And it, it, it pinches us. But you do realize that every American... Every American, including those who would be below the poverty level, are in the top 6% of the world's wealth. I think we can hold on a little longer till the eggs come back around. 
But see, that's the thing. With delayed gratification, what we're trying to do and what we need to do and what would be so wise, you know, you got to do is we are doing what we ought to do now so we can do what we want to do later. That's always been true. Still true today. So I want us to unpack that a little bit. But this is the things, this, this is the fourth thing that I, I believe that I've seen in people's lives is what I've seen in Jesus' teaching and in his life is that you can fuel your faith in a world on empty. Let's do a quick review. Uh, what was Jesus' goal? What, what, what did he say to his followers? What does he say to us is his goal and agenda? He, is, he said, I want you to know who God is, what he's like, and I want you to be able to trust him completely. You need to be all in and trusting him. Trust on to, trust into him every day with your everyday life. And you do that in, in, a, in a gritty way. Because what I've seen in my generation is that we kind of divorced the whole church thing and life thing. And I'm saying Jesus never taught that. He believed that our whole faith needs to be gritty and it needs to be real world. And sometimes it's messy. But it is so real because it is a real relationship with the one and only true God who has expressed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to do things. I want you to confront things. I want you to change things by believing that I am who I said I am and I will do what I said I will do. This is revolutionary if you let it get to your heart. That is why Jesus said, follow me. He said, follow me. And yes, there will be a cost, but at first, just follow me. Listen to what I say. Watch what I do. Test this. And then at some point, if you believe I am who I say I am and I'll do what I said I will do, then it's going to be, then you need to obey me. And then I'll bless. He, he just said, that's the way it works. He said, follow me. I want you to think, feel, act, move, live in a different direction than the direction you are going in. But the church over the last 2,000 years, and that just means any, any form of Christianity, we've, we've always had this gravity of depravity that we pull away from that. Instead of saying, let's follow him and literally do what he's doing, we say, no, you just need to believe in him. Come down to the altar, pray a prayer, pray the prayer that gets you out of hell. It's a get out of hell, uh, out of hell uh, uh, free card because you've believed in Jesus. Nothing's changed about you, but you believe that he is who he says he is, sort of, and I need to pray a prayer and good, it's all done. What that amounts to is we boiled it down to just be, believe a, a whole list of things about Jesus. That he lived and he lived in a particular time and he taught really good and then he died on a cross and he came back to life. Of course, if you hang around with enough people who, who just want to water that down, it's like, well, that was inspirational that he came out of the grave. No, it was inspirational, but it was literal. People died because they saw it and wouldn't stop talking about it. It's like, are you willing to say... I am going to follow Jesus, or are you going to stay in the camp of like, well, I believe in Jesus? Because if you stay in that camp, nothing's ever going to change because it doesn't require any change. That's just a, like, yep, I see that list of things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe in Jesus, but that's where it starts. That's not where it ends. If only you believe, but you never do anything with that, you're going to wind up with a faith that is frail, it's feeble, it's fragile. In fact, if you're in online campus or in this room and you came here thinking maybe I can find some hope, maybe this is why what I just described to you, maybe that's why you lost your faith. Because you thought that faith was a, sin, you know, is a mental ascent to these, these things. Well, you can only sustain that for a while. But whenever you know someone, like I've known Leanne for 42 years, 43 years, but we've been married for, oh, I've known her for 44 years. She's giving me hand signals and stuff, you know. But we committed to one another, like two people who, like, we got into a submarine and they welded the door shut. Because I told her, she told me, it's like, divorce is not an option. Murder's still on the table, but hey. Um... <laughs> You have to sleep sometime. <laughs> or like the guy said, yeah, I've been married for 40 years. Like 34 of the happiest years of my life. Um, when you're committed relationally, and, and you say, we're going we're gonna to have these disciplines that build into our love, and even though there will be rocky times and times we don't see eye to eye, it's the same way with Jesus. He's not always going to say things and do things that you're going to go, oh, that's wonderful. Mm, I just feel God bumped right now. 
If you've been watching The Chosen, they're reenact, reenacting it in a very good way. Because sometimes like, Jesus, we don't like this. And he stops and says, listen, if we're going to have to argue about this, every time I do something, both of us are going to stay aggravated most of the time. I need you to follow me. But if you lost your faith, it's probably because you didn't understand that faith is like a muscle. You have to keep exercising it. Otherwise, use it or lose it. What if you and I were to wake up every single day and ask a simple question and say, what would I do if I was confident that God was with me? What would I do? What would I think up? What would I, how would I live? How would I respond to the difficulties of my life? How would I react if I was truly confident that God is with me? That this is more than just playing church. What, what would I attempt? What would I initiate? What would I literally step out into faith? I don't know what this... I don't know! But I know Him. That's why I think Christ made it very clear that God is most honored if we are living it, if we're doing it, that it is active and is here and now, and it's come what may. It doesn't matter, no matter what, faith. There's no circumstance involved that will undo this faith. That's why we say, what fuels this? What is the rock-solid enduring faith? What are the secret ingredients? What is the secret sauce? Well, Jesus taught and modeled all those things, and he gives us the ingredients, I think, to the secret sauce recipe, because if you hang around with enough people who have durable faith, and you need to get up close to them and ask them questions, watch how they live, if you hang around with those kind of Christ followers, I think you'll see that there's a list that's greater than these five. But I will say over the many, many years I've tried to follow Christ and do it alongside other people, these five things are always present. Always present. That's why we're, 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 we're talking about them. And the first one is practical teaching. If you hear faith stories from people who have a durable faith, they will at some point say, you know what, it's one thing to hear the Bible or read the Bible or anything, but boy, whenever that guy or that girl stood up or, or it, you know, gave me this thing, and it's like it took a passage of Scripture and it actually showed me what it means, and then they said, and this is how you live it out. They gave me handles, practical teaching. It wasn't just reading a book. It's like we put in, in our notes, when our active faith intersects with God's faithfulness, that's when our faith grows. Whenever we hear what he said, you ought to do this, and you step into it. You don't know all the ins and outs of it, but you step into it and you see, wow, he is faithful. That's amazing. Your faith grows. Second thing is personal ministry. Not just showing up at church and going, hey, what's, what's there to do? Which is good. We've got a lot of stuff going on around here. You, you've already realized that. And there's a lot of things to do. But you move from the to-do list to, I believe that Jesus has called me to make a difference in this world, so I am a personal minister of the eternal God, because when I serve other people, I'm serving God. I take that personally. You will hear people give their faith story, their testimony, and they will say, there came a point in which I stepped out of my comfort zone. I, I, I refuse to be, I, I just, so many things that go through my head. <laughs> It's like, I refuse to be a member of the first church of the frigid air, where many are cold and a few are frozen, okay? It's like, I couldn't do that anymore. I had to be involved. It's not, it's not I, I wanted to watch church. I wanted to be church. I wanted to, it was an all skate. And I needed to be in on that. And it was uncomfortable because I'd never done it before and it was outside my comfort zone. But I jumped in and I said, I'm going to serve because those people have a need. Not just on a Sunday, but they have needs. And yet I found out even the simplest thing I can do benefits them. Wow. And what I love about that, I haven't read in my notes, is they did that even when they weren't sure how this was going to turn out. Because, honey... I'm just telling you, if you step into faith ministry, you do not know how it's going to turn out. If you know how it's going to turn out, that ain't faith. But what they saw is, when I did that, God came through, He showed up, and my faith grew, and I helped somebody else. Sweet. Win-win. It's like pushing through, like I said there in your notes, pushing through our inadequacy in order to say yes to God for the benefit of other people. It always grows your faith. Third thing, providential relationships. We talked about it last week. They're providential because we don't control them. God organizes them. He, uh, he orchestrates them. 
And it can happen in so many different ways. Faith, strong faith walking people talk about, you know what? It was like God dropped that guy, dropped that girl into my life at the, it, it seemed like coincidence, but after it happened the 17th time, it's not a coincidence. And like the like testimony that Russell gave us last, last week, it, it could be something like that guy or that girl, that friend, that neighbor invited me into something like a group or they invited me to church and it engaged me. Or guess what? You can have a providential relationship while riding in the back of a cop car with a podcast. Now, Russell and I are neither suggesting that, take that path, not saying that, I'm just saying, don't believe that you are beyond the, the, the reach of a God who loves you. Amen. And it just keeps on happening. God provides these relationships. Iron sharpens iron. As Paul said, your faith helps me, my, my faith helps you. Providential relationships. Staying connected to a community of faith always grows your faith. Because you see God reflected in what he's doing in their life. They see it in your life. Now let's deal with this fourth one. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. But sometimes people misunderstand it. And I would say, write down in your notes, private disciplines is the fourth situation, catalyst, um, environment, in which God does an amazing work to build your faith. Or to be specific, and I didn't give you enough time, you might have to shimmy it in between those two words. And that is private spiritual disciplines. And Christ followers for the last 2,000 years, there's a whole list of them. But I'll tell you this, if you get close to someone who is faith-filled and they, they can walk in faith and you know that it's strong and it's durable and you ask them, tell me your story, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, they will say along the way something more like this. Um, one of the things that really built my faith is I realized that the preacher is not responsible for feeding me. Because we've had people go, you know, I'm going to a different church because I'm not getting fed here. And I'll go, this actually says it's your job to feed yourself. And they said, I broke through on that and I realized it's up to me, maybe sometimes I need a little coaching, but it's up to me to actually crack this open, either electronically or literally, and start reading it, asking questions about it, and saying, what does this mean and how can I connect with the person who wrote it? So they'll say that. I started reading my Bible and I, and, and I started to pray because I think God should talk to you and, I, and, and he says he wants to talk to us and I want to talk to him. They will also say, you know what? And this one, this one gets some people a little sideways, but I love you and so I got to tell you. That is, I started, even though the preacher, I thought he was out of his mind. He's like, I started giving systematically, meaning either every week or every two weeks, I started giving God a percentage of my income, and I did it first. You can do your own homework. I'm just saying that's what people will say. I guarantee you they'll also say things. When I also made it a priority that I'm going to show up consistently for corporate worship in some form, it, changed. it, it, it helped me grow my faith. Now, to go back to what I, I opened all this up with is sometimes the ought to becomes the want to. But it doesn't start that way. It doesn't start that way. What I just told you, for some of you, it makes you terribly uncomfortable. It's like, I don't want to do that. I know. Most of the things we want to do are not really good for us. It's the stuff we don't want to do that's the best for us. Do I sound like your mother? Yes. Okay. Some of you need to laugh, so I thought I'd put something in here. <sighs> This requires that you pre-decide. Title of the message. You pre-decide. I am on a mission today to get you, if you've never done these things before, I want you to commit to pre-deciding this. You decide it right now and not when you feel like it. Think of me as your spiritual exercise trainer. You hate to see me coming, but you're going to love to see me. And you're going to thank me when I go. Okay. Like, when are you going? <laughs> Pre-deciding. Let's give another... Uh, this was the way that we were taught. Because uh, in the spiritual uh, disciplines that we were taught, and I look at Leanne and I, is um, 
you're supposed to have spe- uh, sexual integrity. That's what the scripture says. That, that, that's just a straight up thing. It's between one man, one woman, and it's in the confines of a committed relationship of marriage. That's, that's the teaching right there. We like to color in the gray lines and all that stuff, but that's the teaching. So how do you pre-decide that? Because, I mean, I could have chosen financial, but, but talking about you know, sexual integrity is way more. Um, <clears throat> it, it makes you on edge. So anyway, here's the thing. This was the way one of the guys who was a guy who discipled me and said, this is what you, you, he was a providential relationship. Here's how you do that. He said, if you're going on a date and you're trying to maintain your sexual integrity, then what I would suggest is take a copy of the New Testament and you put it in the seat, because I was driving, like I'm in the driver's seat, Put that New Testament right there, and she'll be sitting over there. I said, I do not see how that's going to help. (laughs) He said, well, if you decide that you're supposed to make a move, you're going to have to crawl over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to her. (laughs) Okay. That is true, but I'm saying that's kind of a silly example. But the point is... Faith-walking people pre-decide to do the good, right, and true things. And, of course, we've already dealt with how do you know what those are. That's where you get the application teaching. But people who pre-decide will tell you that sometimes those pre-decisions are enjoyable, but a lot of times they're not. The first time you're given a pre-decide, it, it's like it's a task list. I have to do that. I have to pay attention to that. But I will say every single time I've done that, and the people that I know who walk by faith, they say, but it grows on you. And you realize, yeah, this is actually how I was wired up. God was telling me the truth over time. And it's like I started doing what God asked me to do, and guess what? That became my lifestyle instead of me just making stuff up as I go along. I am so blessed, so blessed, I thank God that I grew up in a family that preached this pre-decide thing all the time. And because I was a naive child, I thought the whole world did that. And then I grew up and realized, no, they don't. But I'm talking, I have parents, have both sets of grandparents, and they all did this. And they said things like, the most important thing you can do in your life is you must cultivate a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not the preacher's job. It's not your Sunday school teacher's job. It's not our job. You have to cultivate a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it needs to be daily because that's how relationships grow. It needs to be intimate. In other words, you can tell God whatever is going on, what you're mad about, whatever. You just, you you lean into that. And you need to understand, yes, that portion of it is just between you and, and God. But you, you, you learn to wake up with a sense of accountability. That he is the best father. But he is the father, and I am the child. And there is a certain personal accountability to him. In other words, my family helped me to understand I am not dedicated like that to a doctrine. I'm not dedicated that way to a denomination. I'm not dedicated that way to to, to a label or even a, a church or saying this is my belief system. I am committed. I am in a relationship with God. Because if you remember that Jesus' own personal invitation to you and to me and to everybody is, he said, follow me. He didn't say follow a list. He didn't say follow that leader. He said, follow me. And it's daily. It's all-encompassing. This is where, if you're going to build a strong faith, you have to understand at some point, when Jesus is praying, thy will be done, He's serious. Not my will. Yours. Which is very faith walking because you go, but whenever it's my will, then I'm in control. It makes me feel so much better because I am a control freak. And so are you. All of you. All of you.
It also means thy will be done right here, right now, not later. Oh boy, that preacher really gave me God bumps and I'm, you know, next week I'm going to do something about that. No, now! Because you see, rock solid faith that you and I yearn for, because we all do, that rock solid faith is an inside job. It happens in here, and then it spills over into the things that we say, and the things that we think, and the things that we do, and the places we go, and how we talk. But it has to start here. Because if, listen to me, I'm telling you something you desperately need to know because I've been there, done that, don't want to do it anymore. If the externals of trying to do good, right, true things in this world don't come from a personal connection with the God who loves you and sent Jesus to die in your place, if it doesn't come from a personal connection and intimacy, you know what happens? It becomes routine. It becomes predictable. It becomes mechanical. This is what explains what I was seeing in my teenage years but couldn't put my finger on it. How can someone have spent 40 some odd years, I'd look at people and go, how could you have said you are a Christ follower or at least a Christian for 40 years? You'd think hanging around with Jesus that long, you'd become more loving, more generous, more kind, more forgiving. And yet some of the people I saw that were leading churches, they were some of the most cynical, unloving, greedy people. And it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Does not make sense. I'm telling you, if you don't connect what you're doing on the outside with a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to become cynical. You're going to live a hollow life. And I will even go so far as to say, you will become dangerous to the cause of Christ. Because people will look at you and go, if that's what it means to follow Christ, I don't want a single ounce of it. Could I get an amen on any of this? I'm not trying to run anybody down. I'm saying there's a much better life. I'm saying also, if you go down that road, become more critical and more judgmental, and you just go through the motions, one day you will wake up and discover you're no longer following, but you still wear a badge that says Christian. That's one of the reasons why I hardly ever use the term Christian, because I want it to be specific. Are we following Jesus Christ? Whew, that wasn't even in the notes, y'all. But it was in my heart. <laughs> so... I'm saying these private spiritual disciplines critical to our faith. Uh, they unleash God's rule. That's why we sang forever reign. They do it on a day-by-day basis. Like if Jesus is who he says he is, I need him to be the Lord, the leader of my life. Or I've got to examine it as like, this is just something I believe. Okay, these private spiritual disciplines, I will tell you, and Tanya, we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but maybe here in a minute. This is the kind of thing that shapes and fine-tunes our conscience to love what God loves, hate what God hates, all those kinds of things. What bothers him bothers us. That's how you learn how to do this, these private uh, disciplines. Um, there are several, like I said, but let me just give you the ones I see. Most people who have strong faith, this is the ones they, they reference. Daily devotions. Write that down in your notes. Daily devotions. I've been at this long enough. That title's changed. It used to be T-A-W-G. Remember that, Leanne? Christmas challenge and all that. Yeah. T-A-W-D. Time alone with God. Uh, daily devotions. Uh, quiet time. How's your QT? You know, been to enough camps. We did that, right? What it amounts to is you read a little bit of Scripture. You understand what it says. You also spend time in prayer. You let God speak to you. You talk to Him. Christ followers have a strong faith said, and will say to you, I began reading my Bible every day. Let me tell you something right here. If this is new to you, and you have one of these, a literal printed version of the Holy Writ, please, I'm begging you, do not start at the beginning. Okay? You're going, well, that seems awfully weird to come from a preacher. No, God's word is beautiful. It is a, it's a precious gift. And there is a reason why it's arranged the way it's arranged. But it is not arranged logically. Okay? You and I are Christ followers. We are New Testament. All right? Don't start with Genesis because you'll go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, got it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You'll get in the first half of Exodus like I saw all those movies. That's cool. And then you get in the second half of Exodus and then into Leviticus and you're going, what in the world? <laughs> No, no, flip over to the, about the middle, just past middle, and start reading either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I would suggest start reading there and read one chapter a day. Just one chapter a day. 
Why? Because that's where Jesus is. That's where you see him walking, talking, asking questions. I was told by one of my young uh, friends, he said, I just learned. Did you know that Jesus asked in the New Testament? He asked them, uh, the people that were following, he asked them about 306, 307 questions. (laughs) Jesus will mess you up. Okay. People who are strong in the faith say, I read my Bible every day. You read the whole Bible? All 1,189 chapters in one day? No. They read one chapter a day. They just chew on it. Like a, a cow chewing a cud. It's like, mm, that's pretty good. Mm. Swallow it, burp it back up. Chew on it again. That's biblical. That's what it means to meditate on God's word, by the way. You say, I don't think I can do that. You can do this. You will take, it will take discipline. When you start at the front end, it's going to feel so awkward. But I encourage you, follow Jesus through the Gospels. Let his words, let his actions like, like nudge you. Let him speak to you. Let him warn you. Let him remind you. Let him shape you. Let him teach you. But he doesn't want to just uh, talk to you through his word. He needs to hear from you. Jesus had lessons on prayer. Matthew, he's talking about this is how you pray. He says, when you pray. The very fact he's saying, when you pray, it is specific, it is intentional. You don't just drift into it. He says, when you pray, you go into your room and you close the door. This was in a culture in which they did not have the privacy that we have. But he said, you find you a private place, you find a location, and you have a plan. He said, and you pray to your Father who is unseen. He said, it's relational. It is not religious. It is relational and it is based on trust. And you pray to him because he is there even though you cannot see him. And you set aside the focus time, Jesus says, and you need to give God your undivided attention. He not only taught it, he modeled it. We know this because both Luke and Mark speak of this. Luke records in chapter 5, Jesus had been doing some preaching, teaching, healing, all this stuff. And people were definitely coming after him to say, I need more of that. It says, yet the news about him spread more and more so that the crowds of people who came to hear him, you know, had grown. And, and he was so compassionate, he healed their sicknesses. He was busy. He was in demand. Somebody asked me, how was my week? I said, to talk about it. And I'm just saying, you feel this too. My week, this last week, I felt, this is the way we say it in Texas. I felt like a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs. That's how busy I felt this week. You feel busy? Jesus was busy. But in spite of how important his work was, and I would have to say his work was even more important than yours or mine, it says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. He went off by himself and he prayed. Which, you know, gets into all kinds of theological stuff, but I'm just saying, he went and prayed. Then Peter, because we have every reason to believe that Mark, who wrote that gospel, actually listened to what Peter had to say, and Peter was Jesus' right-hand man. And he wrote it down. And this is what Peter probably related to Mark. He said, even in the very first chapter, he said, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus would get up, leave the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In the chosen, they're reenacting this. You got the 12, and they're trying to do their best. And it's like, where's Jesus? Anybody seen Jesus? Oh, my Lord, we have lost Jesus. (laughs) Nah. They didn't know where he was, but he knew where he was. I would imagine the 12 waking up early, fixing breakfast, go in to wake Jesus. Somebody go wake up Jesus. They discover he's gone. Again! It says there in, in, in Mark 1, it said Simon, Peter, and his companions went to look for him. And I love this because, you know, you gotta, you got to school Jesus just a little bit. They found him. And it says, and I appreciate Peter's honesty, when they found him, they exclaimed, meaning their volume went up. Where have you been? Everybody's been looking for you. I think that's funny. My mama thinks it's funny too. (laughs) Here's the takeaway. If Jesus gave the Father the first minutes of his day, then I think we should too. It is a discipline. We acknowledge his greatness. We surrender to his will. We declare our dependence on him, and that's what we do. Because it helps us anticipate what we're about to stress, you know, the day that's going to stress us out. It's going to get us prepared to say no to temptation and yes to him. Uh, We invite God into the very details of our life, and then he starts to show us stuff. Got to go on. Time alone with God, that's one. Second one is percentage giving. Percentage giving. Strong Christ followers will tell you this over and over again. 
that somewhere Jesus is going to intersect your money. Percentage giving is another way of saying you predecide to give God the first and best of what you've earned. Because if you really drill that down to, to, to its basis, the only way you have the ability to earn is because God gave you that ability. But you give a percentage of your income and you do it on a systematic basis because you want to invest in what God's doing and you also want to put God first in your life. And I have, I have a lot of experience with this and trying to help people understand it. Uh, giving, it giving isn't about the money. I, I, you go, but it's a percentage giving and I'm giving some of my money. But it ain't about your money. It's about your heart. Listen, when God, who says you ought to give, he's not running low on funds. As, as, as the Old Testament says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Dude, he's got it. He's not after your money, but they used to say that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Mm-mm. Way to a man's heart is through his wallet. I are a man. I know it gives you this freak out sensation. What if we don't have money for my wife and my kids and myself? We feel like we are in control. It's not a money thing though, guys. It's a faith thing. I'll say it again, fellas. God's not after your money. But he most certainly wants your heart. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6. He says, so don't worry. (laughs) I love that. Well, thank you, Jesus. Because everybody in this, this, this crowd, we all worry, right? They said, uh, you know, he says to them, he says, don't worry what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. We don't quite relate to that because most of us never have to think about where our next meal or our next drink of clean water is coming from. And we sure, you know, the only thing we probably do worry about is what we're going to wear. But that's because, like, do I wear that shirt or that shirt? Or, I don't know, I haven't worn those in a long time. Jesus was speaking to people who had a limited supply of all those things. You know what we worry about? How am I going to get a job when I get out of college? Lord, we want to have kids, but how are we going to afford that? How am I ever going to be able to afford uh, afford retirement? The question being is, what if I don't have enough? And Jesus said, don't worry. Thank you. He said, don't worry, trust God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Jesus said, don't do that because pagans, people who think that they control the little gods that they can carve and put on their mantle. He said, the pagans run after all those things. That's why this is a faith, faith issue. He says, your heavenly father already knows that you have need of all these things. That's where the rubber meets the road. You have to say, do I pre-decide to give God what is the first and best he's allowed me to earn, thinking, well, what if I don't have enough money at the end of the month? He's inviting you to put your money where your faith is. This is his guidance on resource management. He said, this is how you do it. Seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, a good relationship with him which sounds a whole lot like your kingdom come, your will be done. That's what it sounds He says, but anyway, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, all these other things will be given to you as well. Giving is one of those things that exercises your faith because it involves letting go of stuff we think we're in control of and it, act, it actually makes us um, uh, shift away from being more inclined to trust money and trusting onto God. Because it's really the only way to break uh, materialism Um, when you do that, you stop allowing money to control you and you actually control your money under the guidance of God. That's why Jesus says you can't have two masters. And he wasn't saying it's either God or the devil. No, he was saying it was either God or you. Prioritize your life uh, and surrender to his control or you're going to prioritize and surrender to your control. Giving's a faith builder. See, don't get many rowdy amens on that one. Anyway, it's true. The good habit of percentage giving, you say, well, how much should I give? Biblical standard is uh, essentially um, 10%, but the percentage is not what's, that's not the issue. Start with 2%, let it grow. Yes, the Bible refers to a tithe, 
But just start with any percentage because it helps you grow and trust that God's going to take care of you. Now, a lot of people will tell you, well, well, I give when I see a need. Please don't hide behind that. We had, thank you for giving to the carpet fund if you did. That's wonderful. But see, anybody can do that. If that's the only way that you give, that does not exercise your faith. What that does is it reinforces your ego. Look, I had a pile of money. I gave some, and look, I did something on the carpet, which is one of those funny bulletin things. You did something? That's Somebody clean that up. Um, it also has to do with if you think you swoop in and take care of things, what you're doing is what preachers are notorious for. You're starting to put on a cape, and you get a Messiah complex, and you let me swoop in there, and I'll save the day. That's not what he's asking of us. If you're going to follow Jesus, develop the spiritual discipline of percentage priority giving because you will eventually realize it is not a money thing. It's a confidence in God thing. It is a surrender to God thing. It is a follow thing. Third thing. Y'all getting anything out of this today? Come on. Third one, corporate worships. What we're doing today. This is a very uh, uh, important thing. But you're going, some of you love to parse words like I do. It's like, but you said private spiritual discipline and a corporate worship. These are mutually exclusive terms. <laughs> well, that is true because it is done in a corporate setting. But corporate worship is not about saying, okay, it's 90 minutes. That's our case. It's not, it's not a thing about having 90 minutes on a Sunday that you're like, I got to show up for that. Once I get that done to me, then I can go on about my business. Because if you're here online or in person just for the show, you have missed the whole point. Because worship and doing it in the presence of other Christ followers is very personal and it happens corporately. It's the weirdest thing. It's kind of a variation on what we talked about last week, and that is our providential relationships. Here's the thing. Even online, in the online campus, Rock Springs, everywhere, the reason we want you on the online, uh, you know, on, on church center and coming in their way is chatting and talking about what God's doing in your life is a part of that personal and yet corporate worship together. Because that's one thing. I know some of y'all are passing notes. Like, when is he ever going to stop? I know what you're writing. Okay, but online, you can chat. You can talk about the preacher's hairline. You can talk about the message. You can raise hand. You can do all kinds of stuff, okay? But in corporate worship, one of the reasons why I want you to clap during the first part of the song is motion affects your emotion. And a lot of you just drag in here. It's like, move it. Move it. The reason being is that the, the scriptures say dance before the Lord. Amen. There is a part of us that needs to express worship, not just observe it. When people raise their hands, which I love that too, all through all the years, and I'm trying to watch the time. But hey, come on, here. It's so fun. I can usually tell what kind of church background you grew up in. Is that if you grew up Baptist, you sing like this. Okay. If you grew up in some of the Baptist churches that we went to, it's like if you grew up Pentecostal, grew up Presbyterian, but it was you know a revived Presbyterian, like one hand. <laughs> Got to keep. There's all kinds of stuff going on there, but I'm telling you, whenever you are in the presence of God as we worship together and we sing his songs and we pray together and we're singing eternal truth, you can experience, that's why we call it, we don't call it, call it a church service, we call it a worship experience. You experience the presence of God in the presence of other people in a way that you cannot while you're alone. I'm not saying you shouldn't experience it alone, I'm just saying it's not the same. And Jesus declared this mystery, and he left it a mystery. He said this in Matthew, and he recorded, he said, For two, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. 
Okay, I believe Jesus said what he said, and I believe he meant what he meant. And we don't have to delve very far into that. But I will say, I do not know all that he was implying or trying to teach us from that. But I do know even the most basic level. He says, when you gather in my name, there's something that goes beyond learning. And it becomes about experiencing something. And he is here with us. It's very personal. It's very practical. And that is why I say, if you have to miss... God bless, nobody's standing at the door with a clipboard going, well, you're not here. But if you are not attending church more than you are attending church, you're out of balance. Tune in or walk in. Do not take yourself away because there is something that happens. But whenever we choose to do this corporate worship thing, we're giving up a part of our autonomy. And I go back to the guys. We don't like giving up our autonomy. But I'm just telling you, there is something about we that is better than I. Something about it. I don't know how to describe it. This is what I said in the, in, in the New Year's Day message. We are like living stones. All of us together, all stacked together, we make God's house. We're together in it. We're the living stones, all of us. This is how Paul said it in 1 Corinthians. He says, you all. Mom, I believe where we come from. What Paul was saying was, now y'all are the body of Christ. That's what, that's what that is. Y'all are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a necessary part of it. We're like bricks. We're like stones that make the wall of a house. We're like the arms and the legs and the kidneys and the eyes and the toes that make a body. Yes, we are God's house. We are Christ's body. We are a a community that is powered by the Holy Spirit of God. There's just some things about Christianity and Christ following that you cannot experience unless you are in the presence of other believers. Because God's up to something bigger than you and me, but it includes you and me. So you got to choose it. you got to choose it. you got to choose it. Because the bottom line, big idea, faith-building fact for today, one I want to fill in the blanks here, is intentionally choosing to surrender my time, surrendering my money, and surrendering my autonomy in order to prioritize Jesus as, as the leader of my life. That grows my faith. It does it every time. Prioritizing and, and surrendering. So like I said, when our active faith intersects with God's faithfulness, that's when our faith gets bigger. Now, I told you this at the front end. I'm going to challenge you to do. I want you to pre-decide today to do something for the next four weeks. Next 28 days. Mark it down. March the 5th. Between now and March the 5th, I challenge you, I dare you, I double-dog dare you to commit to embrace these three private disciplines. If you have not already done them, And I didn't even put you a little card or fill in the blank. I'm going to see, do you want this? And if you do, it's going to be on you. There's nobody looking over your shoulder. But you write this down and say, I'm in. Okay? You can say, I'm in. But there's what I I put on the screen. God, I am pre-deciding right now to give you the first minutes of the day, first dollars of my income, and the first day of the week for the next 28 days. And some of you are going, I can't write that fast. Take out your phone and get a picture. Don't let anything stand in the way. Because I'm here to tell you from personal experience that God can and will use these three disciplines to grow your faith. Tonya, come on up here and let's just speak of this. And then, uh, band, y'all can come on up too. I've I've, I've run over time. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. But there's so many things I wanted you to know today. I know, and we talked about this, Tonya and I, If you do these things, your character will grow and it will grow to look more like Jesus because that's what Jesus did. Your generosity will grow. Your faith, your trust will grow. Yeah. And it's not like you got up, I'm going to be generous today or I'm going to be full of faith today. It's like, no, I do these disciplines and then I turn around and I look back over what God has done even through tears. Because you and I both know. We've been been through the ringer. (laughs) Yes, we have. And there were all kinds of things that we could have blamed it on. There's all kinds of stuff we could have done. We could have actually, and would have had every logical reason to turn on our heel and say, I'm not going to do it anymore. Not going to follow anymore. But he is faithful. But he is faithful. In the midst of fires and divorce and strokes, engine breakdowns, death. 
He is so faithful. I'm just telling you, when I look at her and a lot of you, what I admire is a no matter what confidence in, in, in God. You say, I want that. Well, friends, this is how you get there. It's going to feel like discipline at the front end, but there's no progress without discipline. And if you tick me at my word, who knows? If you said, I'm all in, and for the next 28 days, I'm going to do the first minutes of my day, first dollars of my income, and the first day of the week to God, who knows? You might actually, by the time March 5th rolls around, you go, I am stronger. God is more faithful. 